Let us pray. Gather us in this morning, O God, as we listen for your word to us. Open our hearts and our minds. Help us to set aside every distraction and to focus for these moments on the mystery revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Action or contemplation, service or worship, hospitality or prayer. For as long as the church has existed, we have debated these dichotomies. Which is more important, kneeling at the altar or mopping the church floors? What should we prioritize? What should we find to be a good balance between the mystical and the practical? In this week's gospel story, Jesus enters a certain village and a woman named Martha welcomes him into her home. And as soon as Jesus and presumably his disciples enter the house, Martha launches into her practical work of hospitality, cleaning, organizing, cooking, serving. Her sister Mary, meanwhile, sits at Jesus' feet taking in every word he says and paying no attention to his harried sister, her harried sister. We have no idea how long Martha's patience holds. I'm guessing she spent an hour or two in the kitchen simmering before her frustration finally boils over. When it does, she marches into the dining room and confronts Jesus. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do the work myself? Tell her to help me. But Jesus doesn't do what he's told. He neither scolds nor redirects Mary. Instead, he redirects Martha. You are worried and distracted by many things, he says. There is a need of only one, one thing. Mary has chosen it and it will not be taken away from her. Well, this is such a brief and seemingly simple gospel story, and yet it raises so many questions. I love that Jesus elevates the role of women by affirming Mary's right to discipleship. Traditionally, only male disciples got a chance to sit at the teacher's feet and study the Torah. This gender reversal is a huge deal, and I do not take that for granted. And yet, I wish Jesus did more. I wish he rounded up all of those male disciples and ushered them into the kitchen and directed them to bake the bread and to fry the fish and to chop the vegetables, perhaps while Martha took a well-deserved nap. <laughs> I also want Jesus to put each one of the men to work and then say, oh, in case you were wondering, this domestic stuff isn't a prelude to the sacred. This stuff is the sacred. Part of what I love and appreciate about the gospel story is its surprising radicalness. As in, wait a minute, Jesus, are you saying we're supposed to be unbalanced here? I'm asking this because we live in the real world and know that for all practical purposes, it is ridiculous to champion contemplation over action, word over deed, the mystic over the activist. Why? Think about needing both. Our common life requires both. How could the church survive without a Martha? A Martha who bakes the Eucharistic bread, a Martha who tends the grounds, a Martha who arranges the flowers and restocks the candles and sews the pageant costumes and dusts the pew. After all, isn't it saying that in this story, Mary and Martha were sisters? Their differences couldn't erase the basic fact that they belonged together. They needed each other. They held each other in balance, right? Or is that not right? The truth is that I continue and try and try to read Mary and Martha's story as a story of balance. 
But I don't think Jesus' ringing endorsement of Mary choosing the better part will allow me to get away with a tepid reading. The truth is that it isn't a story about balance of Mary and Martha. This is a story of choosing one thing, the best thing, and forsaking everything else. The story, you could say, is about single-mindedness, about passionate and undistracted pursuit of a single mind-blowing treasure. Think of all Jesus's most evocative parables. They all point in the same direction. The pearl with a great price, the buried treasure in the field, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Christianity isn't about balance. It's about extravagance. It's not about being reasonable. It's about being wildly and madly and deeply in love with Jesus Christ. So as soon as Jesus enters Martha's house, he turned the place upside down. He messed with Martha's expectations and routines and habits. He insisted on costly change. Perhaps Martha's mistake was that she assumed that she could invite Jesus into her life and still carry on with that life as usual, maintaining control, privilege in her own priorities, clinging to her much-loved, be beloved agendas and schedules. What was Jesus' response to that assumption? Uh-uh. Absolutely not, Martha. It's not how discipleship works. What happened when Jesus entered that house? Mary recognized that his presence required a radical countercultural shift. And every action and every decision, every priority, every lived choice would be filtered through this new love, this new devotion, this new passion. Because Jesus is no ordinary guest. He is the guest who would be host the host who would provide the bread of life and living water turned into his blood and to anyone who would sit at his feet and receive his hospitality. And it's easy to lose sight of Mary in our frenzy, in our work, frenzied, performance-driven lives. It's easy to believe that pondering and listening and waiting and resting have no value. In our age of snarkiness and criticism, it's easy to roll our eyes at spiritual earnestness. In a world that is profoundly broken, it's easy to argue that we should leave contemplation to the monastics and to throw all of our time and our energy into social engagement. The pandemic may have offered us some insight into this story, what it means to do less, and to be. Growing up into maturity in Jesus Christ means being clear about what we're called to do. Being clear that we are called to the work of justice, that we are called to bring liberty to the oppressed and comfort to the afflicted, and may I say, afflict the comfortable from time to time. But every work that we do comes into a full measure of maturing in Christ means that in every work that we do must begin, as Jesus insists, for one thing. And it begins with him. And the place where it does is at his feet. I find it helpful, and I hope you do too, that Jesus didn't call Martha out on her hospitality. I am very sure in my deepest heart of hearts that Jesus probably said thank you to Martha as he exited the space. He did not, it's not her cooking or her cleaning or her serving that bother him. It's a spiritual problem, a spiritual problem of worry and distraction and frenzy. Jesus found Martha in a state of fragmentation. She couldn't enjoy his company or savor his presence or find inspiration in, his wor in her work, receiving anything he wished to offer her, or show him genuine love. All she could do was question, 
his love. Lord, do you not care? All she could do is fixate on herself. My sister has left me, me to do all the work. It left her to triangulate. Tell her then to help me. In all the ways that we try to grow up in Christ, we often forget to slow down, to take some deep breaths, to lean into our creativity that God has given us, and to ask good questions. Is your service or your hospitality rooted in an anxious perfectionism that strangles you? Is your inner life so fragmented or so incoherent that you struggle to give and receive love? Has, has your busyness become an affront to the people that you wish to host? Is your worry keeping you from being present and engaged and fully alive? Have you lost your ability to attend or linger or delve deep into the relationship Jesus longs to have with you? And are you using your own packed schedule to avoid intimacy with God or others? And if I'm honest with myself, many answers to these questions are yes. If yours is yes, too, then I wonder if we can hear Jesus' words to Martha, not as criticism, but as an invitation. Not as a rebuke, but as a soothing balm. Jesus knows that we ache to be made whole. Jesus knows that we place devastating expectations on ourselves. Jesus knows that, that our resentment like Martha's, are often born out of fear and envy. Martha longed to sit where Mary did. She longed to take a delight in Jesus' words. She longed to surrender her heavy burden and allow Jesus to host her. If so, there is good news about growing up. There's a need of only one thing, and that if we choose it, no one will ever have the power to take that away. So let's choose. Let's learn a hospitality that is grounded in love and not fear. Let's begin where God's Spirit invites us to begin, in the presence of the one who values our rest. Jesus is our host, who is waiting for us to sit. Amen.